tamewer is our place, quaint but it lacks not grace, and threat of roving droves of bawling beeves, daunts burnt out lepers less than haunting dreariness and weariness repeating till it leaves. This is the story of John Randall Bradburn, an Englishman who came to Africa and gave his life for the lepers of Mutemwa Leprosy Mission. Bradburn called himself a strange vagabond, and his life was an extraordinary journey of seeking God in solitude and caring for the destitute poor. John Bradburn was murdered in 1979 during the Rhodesian Bush War. His love for the lepers had proved too much for darker forces that wished to exploit those outcast from society. Father Claudio Rossi met John Bradburn 26 years ago and was intrigued by the strange vagabond of God. Now that the petition for his cause of canonization has begun, Father Rossi has come back to Mutemwa to experience once again the life of one of Africa's remarkable eccentrics. My one very special memory of John is once he was in hospital and I visited him. And he said to me, Father, give me your blessing. And I remember so clearly at that moment thinking, you're so good, you're so holy, you're so humble, it's you who should be blessing me. But of course, I gave him my priestly blessing. Now, after 23 years as I return, I know that when I visit his grave, it's John who is blessing me. John Bradburn was born in 1921 at Skirwith in Cumbria, England. The son of an Anglican minister, John developed an early love of nature from walking the fells in the Lake District with his brother and sister. He finished school in 1939 as war broke out and joined the 9th Gurkha Regiment in the Indian Army. He had incredible courage but no taste for war. A fellow officer said that John, in the thick of battle, was mostly bird watching, singing psalms and attending to the wounded. During his time in India, John became fascinated with Eastern mysticism. His own search for God led him to inquire about monasticism and the Catholic faith. The war ended and John, back in England, visited Buckfast Abbey in Devon. Here he worked in the monastery garden and cemetery until his conversion to Catholicism. John already knew that he preferred the life of the solitary and thus began a pilgrim's journey that was to take him through Europe and to the Holy Land as he sought God's will for his life. One night in a small country church near Naples, he privately vowed to the Virgin Mary that he would serve Christ and her through poverty and chastity. It was a promise that he kept to his dying day. Returning to England on the death of his father, John again tried to live the life of the solitary in various religious communities, but to no avail. John uh, wrote to me and asked if there was a cave in Africa. Father John Dove was Bradburn's closest friend and knew him from the 1940s. Well, I, I replied that there were many, many caves, but the problem would be the the fair out, but fortunately at that time the Rhodesian government had, uh, had offered a 59 pound single because they wanted more whites to come out and so he came out on that and I was delighted. <laughs> Father Dove still lives at Silvira House which is where after two years in Africa John came to help. He spent four years here essentially as caretaker but he also continued writing poetry and seeking solitude. His eccentric nature started coming to the fore. At one time, he moved into the hen house, where he lived and slept, and here he typed his poems. This was the room where John lived, but after the chicken house where he lived, he moved in the chicken house thinking people wouldn't come there. But uh, out of interest, so many people came that he chose this. This was the end of a dormitory. It was a boot room. 
just a boot, they kept their boots here. Uh, but he'd had an outside door which appealed to John very much, so he came into this room, the little boot room. And then, now and again, people would come, so he suddenly thought, well, I'll pray for a swarm of bees to come in to keep people out, because he was a poet and a mystic, and he needed that silence. He would come out to meet people when he wanted to talk. So he prayed, and the bees came. He had just a small wooden table, and he had a box underneath where his legs, bare legs were, and uh, the bees came in there and settled in there. There must have been six months in there with him. I only went in once because I was a bit scared of the bees and you had to sit with bees going all around you. I sat over here. John had a bed, I think it was on this side on his little table here and then the bees. And then at night time he would should close the door and in the morning he would let them out. He would open the door and see that they got out all right. And so they got to know him and he, they. John's love of nature found fresh meaning in Africa. Apart from his bees, he was asked to look after an eagle. If you have a longing for solitude, it's not so much something in your character, it is something which, it's God-given, it's a grace which is drawing you into solitude, and you can refuse it if you like, but um, it's not self-made, it's a, it's a grace that comes into you, uh, wanting to, to have dialogue between you and, and God who is giving you this desire. As Sylvira House developed, it became full of people and noise, and John once again felt the need to escape into solitude. In 1969, Mutemo Leprosy Camp became one of the horrors of the then Rhodesia. Some 90 leprosy patients living in a primitive camp with minimal care were dying of old age, disease and desolation. He, as soon as he was here, he knew it was journey's end. This was what our Lord wanted him to do. And this was the uh, termination of his vocation, was to be here. John had expressed three wishes. First, to serve and live with lepers. The second, to die a martyr. The third, to be buried in the Franciscan habit. His first wish was about to come true. John had felt an outcast from normal society, a leper himself. Here at last was a community who accepted him. I don't think he had thought out a, a way of being poor, as it was just natural to him how, how from his pilgrim days. He was 27 years on the road before he found Mutemwa. John had no medical training and had no illusions as to his ability to help. However, the one thing the leprosy patients needed was loving care. John gave this in a unique way, and to his great joy was joined by a small medical team. And the extraordinary thing was, he said to me, well, he said, I've never been a boy scout, and I don't know uh, uh, really what I can give them. And I just said, oh, well, John, you give them yourself. And Red, you go down. But what happened when he came down here was uh, they had been under the hands of these, these orderlies and they, the, who's, uh, and they said that we had been dying of neglect. Uh, he suddenly came with his, his love to these p people. They'd never had love. I think uh, Teresa of Calcutta said that those people she met on the streets had never had love. And he gave them his love. Um, and they, uh, he, he, I remember him going up to Veronica. Oh, Ver and she was terribly deformed. Oh, Veronica, you'll look so beautiful when you get to the kingdom. You'll be a young girl again. And oh, you will be. And she he actually got a smile out of her. I don't think she'd ever smiled before. <laughs> and then this is Stefano, you will. Oh, Stefano, you will be such a handsome young man. And all the all the others in heaven will be looking at you and so on. And he got a smile. So that was his initial gift, and I think it was his best gift. He, he had the spirit in him here, and he was able to give it out to them. Well, then, of course, he put it into action and cooked for them, and, 
and looked after them and what did their washing for them and then when they died he, he dug the graves and he buried all that side was in a sense secondary the great thing was that he brought the kingdom in his heart and gave it to them love has three lights one to another glows a third proceeds between naught overcasts true love because it knows that it possesses being possessed a zest above distresses the lepers were rescued from squalor and neglect and once this chapel was built john was able to meet their spiritual needs the archbishop gave john permission to give out holy communion daily and the chapel also boasted a small harmonium which john would often play late into the night i think you find with these great holy people that um, they give out of the spirit that they receive and then he had to come in here in the middle of the night and spend t two hours in front of the blessed sacrament to get uh, regain strength so in that sense he he gave and then he came in his prayer life and, and got back strength to give more when he went out. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Part of John's prayer life was to climb every day Chigona, the mount at Mutemwa, praying his rosary. Incredibly, he wore a track into the mountainside with his daily ritual. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in the Amen. This cross marks the spot where John used to come and sit and meditate. Today, 15,000 people come here every year to give thanks to God for John's life and for the wonderful witness of love which he gave. Life at the mission was transformed by John's loving care and the increase in medical attention. However, this additional care cost money. New faces appeared on the organizing committee and John was told to cut down on the patient's rations. He refused. The doctors, it was alleged, were overspending on non-leprosy drugs and unnecessary travel. Furthermore, John refused to put numbers around the necks of the patients. They're people, not cattle, he said. Nevertheless, John, the piper of Mutemwa, was sacked. Loath to leave his community, he pitched a borrowed tent on Chigona, but was persuaded to come down. Then a local farmer built him a tin hut just outside the compound. It was a hot house, full of mosquitoes, no sanitation, no water, and it became known as Piper's Vale. St. Francis Xavier remarked that there was no greater suffering than to witness what one had built up for God being smashed down by man. The patients suffered the indignity once again of impersonal care. John watched and suffered with them, and once they had died, he would wash their bodies, dig their graves, and bury them with the dignity so long denied them in life. At last, John was allowed to enter the compound during the day. Blind Peter was bathed again, Veronica given relief for malaria, Moses helped to find his way from hut to toilet. Open wounds were bandaged, bruised hearts consoled. But there was no consolation for the holy anger burning in John's heart. Added to his ordinary sufferings was an increasing sense of being useless and of being thought mad. He, he didn't worry about people who thought him mad. He, he would say to them, oh yes, I'm completely mad and leave it at that, you know, because he, there was no, he, he knew that there was no way in which he could explain himself to people who had no faith and no belief. John's reputation as a troublemaker grew out of his fierce protection of his patients. More and more, the local community were beginning to exploit the leper colony, and all who did encountered John's righteous anger. When he got here, you see, the, the, the orderlies were doing nothing, but they forced the patients to put blankets over their filthy features uh, before they would come near them. 
Uh, that would anger, make John angry. <laughs> he would, he would, he would be very angry if they, if, he, if he, you know, if he saw them doing it. Maybe a clue to John's inner turmoil is revealed in his prolific poetry writing, much of which was written in the confines of this hot and sticky hut. John Bradburn breathed poetry. He wrote some 6,000 poems, sometimes a dozen or more in a day. Their length varies from simple couplets to one 10,000 lines long. He really had only one theme, the nature of the triune God, as manifested in Jesus, born of Mary. From this theme came all others, God's plan in human history, salvation, love and mission. Peter is blind man's buffer against woe. Throughout the frailness of his stricken frame, there penetrates a state of God aglow with grace. To holiness, I trace its claim. Beholding Peter, almost noseless, blind and rather deaf, our father fast we find, and having found him, realize that this apparent wreckage is an heir to bliss. The deep irony is that John Bradburn, this man of God, made enemies. Anyone who hurt his patients experienced his wrath. Locals pinching hens, herd boys allowing cattle to eat the patient's maize, or even the orderlies cutting trees which gave shade and beauty. And then came war. Mutemwa leprosy settlement became more and more isolated owing to the War of Liberation. Guerrillas attacked the reservoir close by and John often heard gunfire and explosions. New birds appeared over Mutemwa, helicopters. The Mujitas killed an old man who used to come to mass at the camp. Over a period of time, John was left alone to care for the lepers in the middle of a dangerous war zone. The situation worsened. Both sides in the war were suspicious of John and his motives for staying with the lepers. John began to have an overwhelming sense that his life was in danger, but perhaps did not realize that his death was imminent. On the morning of September the 2nd, he preached about St. Lawrence, who was martyred by the Romans. John asked the patients to pray that he might have the courage to keep the faith, just like St. Lawrence, when they came for him. Towards the end, he directed his prayer for the conversion of the world, and not just Mutemwa. Later that day, he developed an extraordinary thirst, a real agony. The others rushed out to look for water, but the taps were dry. John had written earlier, come sweet death on Wednesday, if you will, and if you may. And just before he died, the women were very anxious for him to, to leave Matemwa because they knew that he was going to get killed. And they kept on at him and said, John, if you, if, if you get killed, then we, we will simply be, go back into neglect and we'll die of neglect, not leprosy. So uh, at any rate, they were on and on to him. So he went up and prayed on top, on, on top of the, the, the rock there. And, uh, he came down and he said to them that he had seen a, an Angeri Mukuru, which is a big angel, would have been an archangel, who said it would please God if he stayed. And then he said to the women, is it all right, dear women, <laughs> if I stay? And they said, oh, well, if you've seen an angel, uh, then you should stay. And I asked them afterwards, and they said, well, we thought it might be one of our traditional spirits, but he had a tremendous peace about him, and he gave us that peace, and all fear of losing him left us. That night, John was dragged from his hut. His body was found three days later, on Wednesday, riddled with bullets. His second wish was fulfilled. He had died a martyr's death. I had expected it. Uh, when I left him to go on leave, I had, fe had a feeling it was the last time. I would see him because things were beginning to build up a bit, uh, opposition to him and so on. He always prayed to go and join the heavenly choirs. So he, I knew that he was, 
he was where he wanted to be, and that was uh, so a great consolation to me. When they uh, came near the body, the very first sign was, which pleased me so much, was singing, <laughs> beautiful singing. And I knew that John had uh, reached what he'd always prayed to reach. And then they ran, thinking it was real people, it wasn't. And they came back, and then they saw this big bird going up and down. They said, we'd never seen the light before. I just thought it was the Holy Spirit. And then the third time, only a couple or so came back. They're beginning to get scared uh, now. Uh, and then they saw these three beams of light going up from his feet and his head, forming one and coming down as one. Well, in his latter t uh, days, he was he was writing a lot of poetry about the Trinity, and he had a great devotion to the Trinity. Strange things continued to occur. During his funeral, eyewitnesses saw three drops of blood fall from the bottom of the coffin, forming one pool, three in one, a symbol of John's beloved Trinity. The coffin was opened, but no blood was found. John had been dead a week. The opportunity was taken to change John into his habit, fulfilling his third wish to be buried as a Franciscan. The cause for John Bradburn's canonization has been officially petitioned and accepted by the Archbishop in Harare. It contains a very large file of documentation, plus um, an outline of his own life story, plus testimonies of people who uh, experienced uh, alleged cures through John Bradburn, and also contains a list of witnesses who could be called now uh, to give testimony uh, before a tribunal concerning the cause. Well, if all goes according to plan, John Bradburn would become the first saint of Southern Africa. And this would be tremendous joy for all of us, a sign of great hope in our lives, one who searched and found, and one who certainly will intercede for all of us. I think really what the Lord, who designs the, our lives in that way, wanted John to show the world was that this was a temporary uh, dwelling down here, and that we should be pilgrim seekers. Since John's death, many extraordinary things have happened. People claim that there have been signs through bees, eagles. At Mutemwa, people say they have seen the sun spinning in the sky. Much more importantly, people say that through the prayers of John, they have been healed. And most important of all, so many people, through his wonderful example, have turned back to Christ. To those who, loving little, live life not, I make for death no deep apology. To those who look upon it as the cot of rest in Christ till rising, I reply duly with Alleluia. But to die, wait not till death. Die to the deadly seven, Put on in time sublime eternity. Think immortality. Link up with heaven.